This is our 20 foot multi-zone ferret enclosure. The fuzzies love it, and so do we. Let's run through how we built it and give you some ideas and hopefully confidence to give your own project a go. In designing the enclosure, we naturally wanted something optimized for ferrets, but we didn't want a big ugly lump of chicken wire. We put together some simple yet modern design elements to keep us humans happy, whilst engineering a diverse and inside-outside ecosphere for the ferrets. We built this enclosure in two stages. First was an indoor shed, which measures 4 meters or 13 feet wide by 1.3 meters or 4 foot 3 deep. The outdoor zone will extend along the face of the indoor zone, doubling the depth to 9 feet, plus adding an extra 10 feet to the side, totaling 22 feet in length. Let's start at the beginning. Choose a suitable plot, remove any vegetation and measure out the dimensions. Employ some suitable slave labour and hammer home the fence posts. For this first stage, we're building the indoor zone. As this zone will gain a lot of structural rigidity from the solid roof and sides, we've chosen to use only 75mm square posts or 3 inch square posts. The posts set, we then fix the bottom bars and the top bars between the posts, ensuring the structure is straight and square. Then simply nail on the cladding. We've used weather-resistant tongue and groove cladding here to avoid drafts and rain. These are 19mm thick or 3 quarters of an inch for additional solidity. Next step is the floor. We've chosen 2x4s set on metal joist hangers. For the floor we could have gone with a ply or OSB boards, but we went with the old school floorboards instead. These floorboards are then topped with a vinyl underlay and finally, a cheap lino floor rolling. That's the end of the indoor zone, so let's start wrapping around this with the outdoor zones. As the posts will be set in concrete this time, we paint the bottom of the posts in bitumen paint. This will prevent rot for much longer, and we want this enclosure to last decades, right? When the posts are set in the ground, the top frame will sit on these posts and be bolted in place. This requires a notch at the top of the posts, this notch should be done before you set them in the ground. You can quickly notch the posts, many at once. Simply run multiple lines with a circular saw. And then these wood strips can simply be snapped away with a chisel. Where a post sits two beams, four bolts are required. At the end post where there is only one beam, only two bolts. When setting the rear posts, remember they will need to be higher than the front ones to ensure a sufficient angle or pitch of the roof. We then cut all the roof joists. We made these from lengths of 6x2 treated timber. The joists are notched so they sit on the cross beams and then the end is angled for aesthetic purposes. Once all joists are in place, fill between them with noggins. This adds structural rigidity but also stops the ferrets climbing out between the gaps. With the roof joists in place, we fit the roof boards on top. This is OSB3 and is 8x4 panels, 12mm thick. Then on top of the board we put the felting. Don't be tempted to cheap out and use standard shed felt. It's barely fit for any purpose and will fail in no time at all. Again, we want this enclosure to last. On the left we have cheap shed felt and on the right is a premium glass fibre reinforced felt. Not only is the cheap felt so much thinner, see how easily the cheap felt tears. The fibre reinforced felt however is so much thicker and importantly very tough. Another option would have been felt shingles which look great but need a steeper pitch than we've built on our enclosure. To finish the roof, we installed some corrugated plastic roofing. Again, in line with our preference for better is best, we've upgraded to the stormproof version. I wanted to sleep easy in a storm or a heavy snow without fear that the roof caving in or blowing away. Once the frame and roof are complete, we started with the design features. We found these great metal panels, six foot by three foot, and placed these at either end of the front face. That still left a large expanse in the middle to consider, to avoid the monotony of wire mesh, we came up with the horizontal slat design, which bores it around the door.
Now let's move on to choosing the wire mesh. This may seem a mundane purchase, but it's a very important decision. On the left, we have 19 gauge, which is 0.9 millimeters thick. Whereas on the right, we have 16 gauge, which is 1.3 millimeters thick. On paper, they seem similar, but as you can see, they are worlds apart. The 19 gauge wire on the left is just so flexible compared to the 16 gauge, which is actually quite difficult to manipulate. But it's not simply about the strength of the metal, but more about the strength of the weld holding the wires together. It is the weld which will fail when a ferret is aggressively stressing the mesh, not the wire itself. Now, as you might guess, there's a lot of mesh to fix in place, and this is not a task for a fiddly you nail and a hammer. You need a heavy duty stapler to make the process quick and easy. This stapler here, which uses 14 millimeter U-bend staples, To fix the mesh, we simply face fix to the inside of the enclosure. That's pretty much it for the outside. You can fit on a gutter system and run the rainwater off to the side if needed. Now it's for the fun part of fitting out the inside areas for the ferrets. The first and perhaps greatest idea we had was to create a hill in the middle of the outdoor zone. This seems so simple, but the ferrets just love it to bits. They're always running around, jumping on it and sliding down the hill. Just create a mound with the leftover earth from the post digging. We embedded a simple drain pipe for added fun. Then we covered the whole floor in wire mesh. This covering was needed mainly to prevent them digging out, but also helps retain the hill's structure when humans are walking on it. Again, use 16 gauge wire here, as the 19 gauge stuff just disintegrates, even if it does say it's galvanized. Next, we laid the weed barrier and an artificial grass on top. Finally, we dressed the area for varied texture and enrichment. When planning the activity areas, don't forget to make use of the space above the floor, and not just on the floor. We have hammocks, mezzanines, nest boxes and shelving. All interconnected by a 4 inch clear ventilation hose. Clear hose is so much better than the black hoses in that you can watch them play and also you can see when they've stored or got something stuck halfway down. The downside of that is that the polyurethane plastic is very unstable in UV light so the tubes eventually disintegrate and need to be replaced every 18 months. Next we look at how we created different zones and independent living areas. You can either make use of existing fence posts or fix new vertical supports to the top and bottom beams. This provides the frame into which we can fix the horizontal bars to support the floors of the new living area. The same horizontal bars are fixed at the rear and then simply fix floorboards or ply to create a floor. This can be left open or you can create a vertical central post and then fit doors to close off the new area. The same general approach was used to create an entire zone independent of the rest of the enclosure. Again, just fit a bottom bar on the base and one at the top or use an existing roof joist. And then ensure that there are vertical posts on either side to support the frame and the door and the mesh. Finally, this same method was used to create independent living quarters at one end of our indoor zone. That's it for our enclosure build run through. For a full tour of the finished product, click the video card on screen or check out our other videos. And please do like and subscribe to support our channel. Thanks for watching.